And this is how long your sensor needs light to hit it for, for it to record the image. All right, you guys, uh, some of you might be old enough to remember um, the Polaroid cameras where you took the picture and you stood there and you waved it like this <laughs> until the picture became visible, right? So that um, takes a while for the exposure of the air to render the picture visible. Your camera sensor inside your phone or your DSLR can take that light and make it work much faster. Um, but you can also change that. It's one of the big things in digital photography brought to us. It used to be back in the days of film photography. Uh, back when I started doing photography, when there was the 19 in front of the year instead of 20, um, you had to choose when you could roll the film into your camera or what the ISO was, the sensitivity of your film. And then you were stuck with that sensitivity until you took all you know, 12, 24, maybe even 36 pictures. Um, and then you can put in a new roll and a new sensitivity. Now you can switch it between every shot if you want to. Uh, and if you really want to, you can just let your, your camera decide what the sensitivity is going to be, and it'll do it whenever it needs to. But what your camera is going to do when it makes a picture is it's going to look at what's the aperture that you have, how wide open is the hole, how long is the shutter going to be open for, and how sensitive is the image sensor for receiving that light. And those three things in combination can give you the exposure. So what happens when you make decisions about what your picture is going to look like is if you decide you're going to open up and make a bigger hole so that twice as much light gets in, then you only need to have the shutter open half as long and you get the same exposure. Right? It's simple math, simple ratios. So when you're putting together the way you take your picture, your camera is going to look at those three things, combine them together and give you the exposure. Now why would you want to change some of those things? Well, the answer is that each of those three things, the ISO, the shutter speed, and the aperture, control aspects of how your picture looks. Okay? So you remember how I talked about focus, and I showed you this picture here, um, where the only thing in focus is the one point of the hilt of the sword, and then everything, even like half an inch behind it, is already out of focus. That's because I had a very, very wide open hole on my camera, and that makes what's called the depth of field very shallow. Depth of field is how much in front of and behind the point of focus are in stay in focus. Okay? So the point of focus is if I'm taking a picture of you, then I put my focus on you. The depth of field is how much in front of you and how much behind you will also be sharp in the picture. Okay? So if I want to get all of you in focus in this room, I need to have a fairly shallow, uh, sorry, a fairly small aperture in order to have a deep depth of field to get the entire room in focus. Um, but in what I did here, I had a very wide open aperture in order to show you only one piece of the sword and get you really to focus on that detail. Because the depth of field is what's controlled by the aperture. So if I make that hole bigger, in order to keep the same um, image exposure, I have to have the shutter open for less time to keep the equation the same. So my camera will make the shutter speed go faster in order to keep the picture with the right amount of light in it. So the shutter speed uh, is the next thing to think about, and that controls motion blur. So if you're taking pictures of your friends who are posing in cosplay, that's one thing. Um, and you, can, you usually get them to you know, stand still for a little while. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys have kids, but if you ever try to get a toddler to stand still for more than one five hundredth of a second, good luck to you. Uh, so if you're taking pictures of moving subjects, you need to have a faster shutter speed to freeze the motion. Okay. Sometimes you want to have blur. Uh, I took some pictures, I'm going to show you one a little bit later, of the, uh, the sword work demonstration last year where they were chopping bamboo. And I want the sword to blur and have the bamboo emitted. Right? So I actually want to have a shorter, uh, sorry, a longer shutter speed because that lets the motion of the sword continue through when you get that blurring effect in the picture. Right? You've probably all seen pictures where somebody's blurring like that. But sometimes you want to absolutely freeze that motion, right? You want to get like the drops of sweat flying off them in the air, every single drop frozen. And that's where you want to have a really fast shutter speed. So if you want to, if that's what's most important to you, you want to set a very fast shutter speed in your picture. Um, or you can do it really slow. And if you do it in like multiple seconds, you can literally have somebody walk through your picture and they won't even show up if you're doing a 30 second exposure because they're just not in it long enough. Okay, it's the way they do some of the light painting and that sort of stuff. Is you literally have the guy walk in on the picture that he's taking, shine his flashlight on something in the pitch dark, and he doesn't show up because it's so dark and he needed to be in it so long to show up in the picture that the fact that he's moving around means you don't see him. It's one of the things you can play with. 
And the last thing is the exposure. Remember how I was talking about when you take pictures at a party at night and they have all those like flex through the picture? That's called digital noise. And we usually try and minimize the amount of digital noise that we have in pictures. So the lower the ISO, which means it's less sensitive, the cleaner the picture looks. So I always try and shoot at the lowest sensitivity that I can, but I want to get the aperture that I want for the depth of the field, and I want to have the shutter speed that I want for freezing motion. So that's all that I want to tell you about the technical side of things, and I'm going to show you a chart here to help to explain all the stuff that I've just used words to show you. So, apertures are the F number. Uh, and that's, don't worry about what it means, but basically the smaller the number, 1.4, is wide open because it's a ratio, so it's a reciprocal number. So the, the larger the number of your f-stop, the smaller the hole is that light's coming through, the more is going to be in focus between the front and the back of the picture, okay? So if you look at the f1.4, this one here is an f1.4 lens on this, by the way, it's really great for low light um, because it can let an awful lot of light in when you're taking pictures. That's the main reason why I have an f1.4, is to take pictures in low light. But you can see that the person who you're focusing on is in focus, but the, you can't even tell what's in the background there, right? On that first one. If you look at the other end of the spectrum on the f32, that's where you have the person in focus and the mountain 10 miles behind them also in focus. So everything to infinity is in focus, um, but you need an awful lot of time for enough light to get through that little tiny hole that the light is able to come through at the F32. So the second one down here is about freezing motion. Right? One one thousandth of a second, you're going to freeze a moving car, assuming it's not like an F1 car. Um, you'll be able to stop a bicycle in motion at about one two fiftieth of a second. You know, you'll get the bike rider, again, unless you're doing Tour de France, um, you get a bike rider like completely frozen. And then if you go out to like half a second, you're not even going to be able to stop somebody who's just sort of turning and moving in the room. They're going to be quite blurry. Okay. And the last one here uh, that I want to talk about is the, the ISO. And you can see as it goes up, the numbers go up, you get more and more and more of those flex in the image that make it look an awful lot worse. Those numbers are old, so it's 25,600 at the end there. Most cameras these days can go up to 6400 pretty easily. They look quite good. Um, the, this current camera that I bought this year goes up to 819,000 ISO. Um, I haven't actually tried it at that number, uh, but I've gone up to about 12,800 and it looks pretty darn good. Um, so don't worry about the numbers on the bottom there, just worry about the effect that it has on the pictures that you're taking. What was that bottom static one again? Sorry, what was the... On the... What was that? Digital noise, right? Noise, digital noise, yeah. Okay, so are there any questions about the technical aspect of things? Because I don't want to go any more in depth into the mathematical side. We've already had two people walk out, I don't want anybody else to leave. <laughs> uh, if not, I, you really, you don't need to know too much about this. What I really want you to think about, especially if you have cameras um, where you have control over these things, is that the bigger the aperture you use, the less depth of field you have, but the faster your shutter speed will be. The faster your shutter speed is, the more motion you will freeze. And the lower your ISO, the less noise you're gonna have in your picture. So those are just the three things to think about when you have control over some of those things. And even on your phone, you can download apps that give you control over some of these settings. Uh, the latest versions of iPhones and um, Samsungs and Huawei's and whatever have them built in. Uh, but even on my older iPhone 7, I paid a couple bucks for an app that gives me control over aperture, shutter speed, and that sort of thing, even on the older iPhones. Mm -hmm. um, so you can get that sort of thing to have those. Controls. What's the name of that app? Uh, I think it's called D Digital Photo Pro or something. Um, Pro Camera is the name of the app for Thanks. my iPhone. Uh, but everybody will have different things. One of the things that I don't do a lot of is uh, try and explain to people exactly how to do things on their camera because every camera has different stuff. Every phone has different ways of doing things, so it's not going to be a lot of, this is how to use your camera. This is going to be about the basics of how to take good pictures. So, let's move on into composition, because this is the stuff that I really want to teach you guys. And this is the stuff that's the same whether you're doing visual, like drawing art, or whether you're taking pictures. These rules, filling the frame, the rule of thirds, leading lines, catching the decisive moment, using positive and negative space, these are the things that are going to make your pictures ones that actually um, you're really proud of that help you to tell a story 
and then make your pictures look an awful lot better. So if you start to follow these rules as you're taking pictures, your pictures are going to be ones that you're going to be happier with and more proud of. Um, and that, well, if you care about that sort of thing, well, you know, get you more likes on Instagram and that sort of thing. Because I know it's all about the likes that we get in the picture, right? Yeah. Except when we don't post the memory because we don't have time for that. So these are the things that we're going to be practicing in this workshop is, is these rules of composition here. And the first one is to fill the frame. Okay? So this picture here, uh, that I chose to illustrate filling the frame. I also have a focus, and literally you're only looking at two things that are maybe half an inch thick and like an inch wide, right? So you're looking at a very little bit of space here. What you don't know here is that this was actually taken in the dealer's room at Oticon. Can you tell that this is the dealer's room at Oticon? You can tell that this is the dealer's room at Oticon? Sorry? Okay. Um, actually, there's nothing in there that's, because uh, what I did is I put a piece of black cloth behind it. Lighting, are you seeing a reflection on there? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so you can see that there's like a fluorescent light over top, right? Because that's the light that you have in there. But I took shot this in the dealer's room, right? So there's literally hundreds of people around me because I'm taking this picture. Um, you can't even see the blade of the sword, the naked blade that's there. Um, just behind that is a piece of the rock that the ore came from. You can't see that in there. Because I chose to fill the frame with what I thought was most important for you to look at in this picture, which was the detail on the pommel of the sword and on the scabbard. Right? So when you fill the frame with your subject, it tells the viewer what's important for them to look at. Okay? So what I would like you to do is right now get out your camera, and I want you to look around the room, and I want you to find something and I want you to take a picture just where you're sitting at the widest setting that you have, which includes that item in the picture. And then I want you to get up and physically move around the space and fill the frame with what it is that you want to take a picture of. Okay, and I'm going to give you a very quick example. And these are not going to be phenomenal pictures because I'm just doing this to give you an example. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my picture here. And then I'm going to fill the frame with my subject. And I'm quickly going to come down here, and I'm going to show you guys the pictures that I took. Okay, so here is my first picture. Okay. You can't really tell what I care about, can you? But if you look at the second picture, you can tell what it is that I'm talking about, right? So this is the first picture, this is the second picture. You can tell in this one what I care about, right? Okay, here's the first picture, the second picture. Okay. First picture. There we go. First picture. Second picture. Okay. First picture. Second picture. Alright, you can see the difference. When I show you the second picture, you know exactly what it is that I'm looking at. Side as well. So where you guys can see, right? So here's the first picture. And this is doing the zooming. Let's hold the camera out, so I apologize. Okay. One, two. First picture. Second picture. Hmm. Here's the picture that I took of the whole room. That's what I want you to focus on. So by filling the frame with what I care about, I tell the viewer what I want you to look at. So take two pictures, okay? Take a picture that just shows, has your, your thing that you care about in it, and then go and actually take a picture of it, get close to it. And then I want you to turn to somebody else in the room and show them your first picture you took, and see if they can tell what you cared about. And then show them the second one, show them that they were right or not. Okay, so let's get up. Move around, take your pictures.
and the way you take pictures when you're out in the field goes one thing to understand it. It's another thing to actually be able to make it work for your pictures, right? Perpendicular plane. The aperture won't matter much in this picture. Where aperture would matter is if you came and stood on the side of it and shot down the row of them. And then you pick, like, say, the second one for the table. So the ones in front of it were blurry and the ones behind it were blurry, then that would matter. But when you're shooting, um, the perpendicular plane is what's going to be in focus. Right? So everything on that line going with that level will be in focus at the point of focus. It's only what's in front of behind that perpendicular line to where your camera is pointed. That's what gets affected by the depth of field. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, in the community, I've been here for about now, now 12, 13 years, and I just wanted to see the Yep. Here's the thing, that should be more of a widescreen shot, there, but therefore by 3, 16 by 9. Huh. Yeah, right, so what you're doing is you're saying to me, on the first one, first one, it's, okay, so here's everything on the desk, and here you're saying, these are, this is what's actually much more important to me out of that, or I want you to look at the phone and the charger and that sort of yeah. thing. Yeah. Okay, has everyone had a chance to take their couple shots and share them? So you see how that looks much better, right? When you fill, like this is a much better picture because it really tells you what it is you want to focus on uh, and helps you to, to look at it better. Yeah. Any 
you see how your um, focus is different than the two as well? I see that, there's not much difference. It's more the angle of view that you changed, right? Yeah. So, but you can still fill the frame with the backpack to the point where there's literally nothing else in the frame. Like you could have focused in on the, um, the logo, for example. And I think the other one shows with the, the lens really shows the difference in the, the, the sort of the wider and then the focus. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so your focus here is like on the wall behind the guy. That's what's going on. So, yeah. That happens from somewhat regular the cameras. Because the, the computer inside the camera doesn't actually know what you care about. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So you can see the difference, right? When you fill the frame. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. So now you can tell exactly what it is you want. Yes. Okay, so let's come on back and sit down and we'll move on. Right. You're very welcome. Let's move on to our next topic, which is the rule of thirds. Now, if you learn nothing else today and you want to take better pictures, this is the rule to pay attention to. Okay. So the rule of thirds, this is another piece of psychology. Um, this is another piece of psychology in terms of knowing the way the brain works, okay? So the human brain thinks that something called the golden ratio is the best way that something can look, which is to say, this is something that the Greeks discovered thousands of years ago. So if you have a ratio of 1.6 to 1, the human brain thinks that, that looks really, really good. So if you look at the way um, the Greeks built buildings, they used that ratio. The things were 1.6 times the height compared to one times the width, that sort of thing. So when we're taking pictures, we approximate that with the rule of thirds. And the way the rule of thirds works is sometimes in your camera you can actually set it to do this, but even if you can't, you can visualize it. If you picture a tic-tac-toe board inside your camera viewfinder, okay? you will find that there's lines about one-third of the way in from the right-hand side, one-third of the way in from the left-hand side, one-third from the top, and one-third from the bottom. Now, most of us, when we take pictures, we put the subject right in the middle. Right? How many of you guys are taking a picture, stick the thing that you want to take a picture of right in the middle of the frame? Your camera actually encourages you to do that because that's where it tends to focus, first and foremost, is what's right in the center. That actually makes for a really boring picture. So if you want your picture to look better, use the one-third lines and put your subject on those lines. So if you look at this picture here, you'll see that the guy's face, I didn't actually put right in the center of the picture. I put him about a third of the way in from the right-hand side. Right? And that makes the picture a much more interesting picture, and it pleases your brain more because I'm using the golden ratio of 1.6 to 1. So there's 1.6 times as much space in front of him as there is behind him, right? I've also used the one-third, roughly, his eyes are roughly one-third of the way down from the top, and the ray gun that he's working on is just about sitting on the one-third from the bottom line. Uh, and I didn't quite use the rule of thirds as well from the top and bottom because I was filling the frame with him so you didn't see the other 300 people in the Shoestring Scientist workshop uh, that I was shooting this at. But you can see that I put him on the one-third from the side and when you're taking a picture of an individual person, the most important thing in the frame is the person's eye that is closest to the camera. Okay? So I put his eye, basically it's just above the point where the one-third from the right line meets the one-third down from the top line. Because if you look at those points of intersection between the vertical one-third lines and the horizontal one-third lines, those are the most powerful places in a photograph that you can put something. So if you picture where one third of the picture is about here, one third of the picture is about here. Right? So you see that his eye is on this one third line coming in. One third across the bottom puts it just about across his collarbones, and just about where his second eye is, is where the other one third line is. Okay? So I put his eye as closest to me, just about on the point where those two one third lines meet. 
because that's a really, really powerful place in a photograph to do that. And then he's actually looking straight out at me, but sort of also a little bit towards further into the frame. Because when you have a person in the frame and they're looking in a direction, you want to have them looking further into the photograph rather than out of it. Because that helps the viewer to feel comfortable with it. If you see somebody in a photograph and they're looking out of the frame, your brain says, what are they so interested in over there? And you get kind of nervous because it might be something dangerous. This is part of our lizard brain. Um, it says, watch out, danger, danger, danger. Uh, but it's not a silly robot with its arms flaring like it was in Lost in Space. Uh, but our brain is uncomfortable because we don't know what they're looking at if they're looking out of the frame. So if you have somebody looking, you want them looking further into the frame. Similarly, if they're moving, you want to have space in front of them for them to move into. So if he was walking towards me, where I am right now, I would want again have him on the far side of the frame moving towards me because it makes the viewer feel better because they know where he's going. Okay, if he's moving out of the frame, then the viewer says, why is he running away? So we want the viewer to actually feel comfortable with it, so I have him looking into the frame, and I have people moving into the frame, because it makes the viewer feel better about looking at the picture. So what I would like you to do now is, again, take a couple of pictures, and this time I want you to have a subject in mind, and I want you to take a picture where you put it right in the center of the picture, like you've been doing all your life, and then I want you to, to have a picture, and you can even do a couple pictures, where you experiment with the rule of thirds lines. Sometimes I've had people do this, and they'll pick a fairly big subject, and so when they put it on the rule of thirds lines, it doesn't actually look all that different. So in that case, if it's like a person, um, you want to pick a part of it that you want to have on the one third line, something that's really important about it to you. Uh, so if it's a person, it's the eye that's nearest to you that you want to think about where that goes. Okay? But pick something in the room, or somebody in the room, and take a couple pictures. One where the, your subject is right in the center, and one where you're playing with the rule of thirds. And then if you want to get a little bit creative, try using the top and bottom rule of thirds lines, the right and left ones, and see how you think that picture looks. Because one of the things that got said at the beginning is that uh, what makes a good picture is personal opinion, and that is absolutely true. Everybody has a different opinion about what they like in photographs. Some of the best photographers in the world, I don't like their work. Um, because it just doesn't appeal to me. So photography is subjective. But behind that subjectiveness are things that are mostly universal. You can learn rule of thirds is one of those things. So get your camera, pick a subject, and take some pictures, one with it in the center, and then play around with rule of thirds. And take a look at your pictures and see how you feel about them. you got about five minutes. So arise if you wish to arise. If your feet hurt and you want to stay seating, then stay where you are. But still take pictures, play around with the rule of thirds, and see how you feel about the pictures you get. shutter button halfway down, it focuses and it locks in the exposure, um, okay? And then you can move your frame around and it will keep the focus on the same place. Um, I personally prefer to use my center focus point. I get my focus, I recompose my shot, and then I shoot. I've been doing that for 20 years, uh, so I do it very quickly and, and it works just fine. 
If I'm shooting on my iPhone, I can do the same kind of thing. And on the iPhone, what you do is when you have the picture that's in front of you, you tap and hold on the screen, and then it will use that point to pull its focus and its exposure from. Okay? So you can choose to focus on something that's not in the middle by tapping and holding on the screen. It'll draw the focus there, and then you hit your shutter button on the iPhone. Again, I don't know um, everybody else's phone, so I, I can't help you if you're not an Apple geek like me. Um, but that's how Apple works. I'm guessing other ones are pretty similar in terms of the way that works. Um, but that's how I, I put the focus on something that's not in the center um, through either of those techniques that are there. Thank so, you. Uh, yeah, so rule of thirds is the most important thing you can learn for making your photographs look better. Um, what I always say when I'm teaching this to NGO staff in the field is if you want to make your pictures look better, learn the rule of thirds. Because when you send me pictures that are on the rule of thirds, they're going to be ten times better than the pictures you send me where the subject is just standing in the middle. The next thing that we can use to help to uh, tell the viewer what we want them to look at in the picture is what are called leading lines. So what you see in this particular cosplay picture that I've got here is that I've used the gun to draw your eye back to the guy lying on the ground. Right? He's relatively small in the frame, but because I've used the line of that gun, the line of the, uh, the cloth that it's sitting on, and even the lines in the carpet can point up towards him. So you follow those lines with your eye and you end up looking at him uh, before you look at the people that are standing up behind him. Because I've helped to guide your eye by including those lines in the picture. Right? So you can use something um, really obvious, like a gun, to give you a leading line to pull the eye in. Um, but you can also use like the edge of the table, you can use um, pretty much anything you can find, but you can also use what are called uh, invisible leading lines. And some of the most powerful ones are, hey guys, look over there. Okay? If you do that to a dog, my dog looks at my finger. Uh -huh. That's why I say, Harper, there. And she's, she's looking here. But as a person, you know that this indicates a direction. And so you look that way, over to that wall. So if I have a photograph with somebody pointing, you look in that direction. And you remember how I told you that the direction a person is looking in a photograph is also important? Because the way a person looks acts as a leading line, because you look to see what it is that they're looking at. Right? So if I have a picture where someone is being rude enough not to be looking at me, the viewer, because quite frankly, the person looking at the picture thinks that they're the most important thing in the universe. So anything in the picture should be about them, right? It's all about me. So if I look at a picture, it should be about me. So the person should be looking at me. Right? So when I come back to him, he's looking at me. This is good. I like him because he's looking at me. This guy isn't. He's looking down at a gun. But the direction he's looking at is something that I'm now going to pay attention to because what's he looking at that's more important than I am. Right? So the human brain is very, very vain. So it's going to want to know what is more important than me that somebody is looking at. And you're going to look in that direction. Okay? So you can use the direction a person is looking or the direction a person is pointing as another kind of leading line, even if it's not as strong as a gun going back to somebody's head. Um, you can still use that direction of gaze as a line as well. And what that can do is it can just sort of help to reinforce what's important in the photograph. Uh, and it can help to draw people's eyes in. Because when you want people to look at a picture, you want them to have things and layers to look at in a picture where they want to keep looking at it for a little while. Because um, often in our world, we're just sort of scrolling, right? We're scrolling through our Instagram feed, we're scrolling through our Facebook feed, um, and then we see something that's interesting and we pause, and we may expand it and look at it for a few seconds. And when we're doing that, it's because there's something engaging in there. Um, often it's because we know the person, right? How many of you guys, uh, when you're scrolling through, oh, hey, I know them, and you're going to double-click the like on the picture of your friend, right? Um, but sometimes it's because there's something really intriguing in the picture, and the photographer has actually done it in a way that makes you want to pay attention to it and work with it, okay? And you actually want to look at it and, and spend a bit more time as your eye moves around it. And they've actually done research into how people's eyes move around photographs and what helps to keep people looking into the picture. Um, and so there are tricks that you can use to do that. Um, there are some other psychological tricks that go along with lines. When you have lines that are horizontal or vertical, that gives a sense of stability and unmovingness. That can be good or that can be bad. 
if you have a, somebody who's doing sports and they look like they're not moving, unless it's sumo wrestling, it's probably not very good because sports is about motion. Right? So I don't actually want things to feel like they're not moving if I'm shooting um, you know, somebody like jumping to, to hit a jump shot in basketball. I actually want to have a sense of motion in that picture. But if I'm taking a picture of a building, I want that building to feel solid. So I want the vertical of the building to be straight up and down. Have you guys ever looked at buildings and it looks like they're kind of coming together and it looks kind of weird and you're not quite sure and you don't really like it? Because it feels like that building isn't solid. And you're looking at it and your brain wants it to be straight up and down. And so they sell very, very, very expensive lenses called tilt shift lenses so that architectural photographers can't make buildings look like they're straight up and down because it makes you feel better about that building when you look at it in the picture. Okay? Because when the building is coming together towards a point, unless it's the pyramids in Egypt, um, your brain thinks it's wrong. So it wants those to be straight up and down. So you use the lines in a picture to help the viewer to feel that something is solid and secure by having a straight horizon. When the horizon is tilted, again, you feel like maybe you had too much to drink because the entire world is looking kind of funny to you. Uh, or if the buildings are on a bit of an angle, you think you're in an earthquake because the buildings are falling down. Um, some of the pictures I was shooting in Zimbabwe were the results of landslides. So there, the buildings are not on a straight up and down angle because the buildings are no longer on straight up and down angles. But when I'm shooting this kind of thing, I want the verticals to be vertical, the horizontals to be horizontal. But when I want to give you a sense of dynamics and movement in a picture, I'm going to use a diagonal line. So I deliberately set that up so that the gun gives a diagonal and the cloth on the ground makes a triangle. Right? So there's two lines coming together, converging on the cosplayer. And those two lines making that triangle help to reinforce the dynamics and the movement of the picture and help to draw your eye towards it. Okay. I don't always use leading lines in pictures, but when I get a chance to do a picture like this, I enjoy doing it because it really lets me play with that and use them to reinforce things. Straight lines give a sense of um, and, uh, like motion, but curved lines give a sense of peace, harmony. So if you want a picture to feel more like it's nicely harmonic, then you want something that has gentle curves in it rather than having straight lines. So you can, again, we were talking about how you want to tell your story in a photograph. The, the way you use lines in a photograph can really help somebody to get a feel from it because the brain just has natural connections it makes with different directions of lines and different styles of lines. So what I'd like you to do now is I want you to take a couple pictures in, in this room again. Uh, one using straight lines, you can use them either horizontally, vertically, or you can use them on diagonals. And one using curved lines, because I can see an awful lot of lines that fit both those styles. And then think about them as you look at those pictures about what's the feeling that they give to you. Um, and can you use those lines to draw the attention to something like I use the lines in here to draw the attention to the cosplayer. Okay, so you can get your camera, get up, move around, and take a couple more pictures. And let's take a look uh, at your own work and see what you're feeling about the pictures that you're taking. precise organization of forms which gives that event its proper expression. He spoke French, so you know, I'm sure this sounded much better in French than it does in <laughs> But basically what this means is that when you are taking a picture, there is a, there is a time, just a moment in a scene where everything comes together. Where the person's gesture, where the light hits them just right, where two people look at each other, and you know it when you see it. Right? You've all just sort of been watching a scene and I'm sure every single one of you has said, man, I wish I had a camera and captured that moment. Yes. Right? So the trick with the decisive moment is to actually have the damn camera and capture the moment. <laughs> right? Easier said than done. Though. There are things that you can do that can make it better. Because the thing that's going to make you better at photography is practice. Um, is actually having a camera in your hand. And then is being ready and open to finding that decisive moment. Okay? So I knew these guys were going to be chopping the bamboo. 
because they ran this workshop twice last year at Oticon, and I went to it the first time, and I had the angle completely wrong to get the picture that I wanted. So when they re-ran the workshop, I made sure when they hit that point in the workshop that I was in the right place to get the bamboo in the air as he cut the sword through the bamboo. I also was shooting about eight frames a second. Because, you know, that helps too. <laughs> but when you're working at the decisive moment, what you really want is to capture that moment when everything comes together and makes the picture the best picture it can be. But what I have at the bottom there is audiences during events. And this is because oftentimes when we're watching people performing something, we're so busy watching them, we're not watching the people who are reacting to it. Uh, and particularly with something that's like a comedy, and you get people relaxed and laughing and having a good time, you get amazing pictures of people. I don't know if you guys have friends that are like this, um, but I have friends that as soon as you pull the camera out, they're like... <laughs> <laughs> and you can never get a picture of what that person actually is. I can't capture their essence. But if you can capture them when they're focused on something else, and you can get them laughing and relaxed, you can get a great picture. Um, my favorite example of this particular type of work is when I went to Haiti after the earthquake there. Uh, I went to a, a school and the students put on a performance for me and I don't speak Creole. So I didn't understand what they were saying, but I knew that one of the kids who was performing was like the biggest am I've ever seen. And so he was like that class clown that, you know, anytime he gets up and says anything, the entire class is stitched over there, right? So he's up there and he's performing and I don't get any of the jokes he's saying but I'm watching the audience, and there were three girls sitting in their school uniforms in the front row, and as he told a joke that they just started laughing, I got a shot of them. Um, and I've taken pictures of the performers as well. But when I got back and submitted the photos to uh, the paper that I was working with at the time, um, the one that got the front page of the paper was the three girls laughing, it wasn't the guys performing. Because it was just such a natural picture and it captured them so relaxed and happy, um, even in the aftermath of the, the Haiti earthquake. Um, that that was what really captured people's attention in that photograph, right? So if you're at something like an event, look at the people around you as well. Uh, one of the pieces of advice that often gets given to photographers is look behind you. Because we get so busy paying attention to the beautiful sunset that's happening there and trying to get it exactly right that we miss um, the gorgeous you know, bird behind us that's like an endangered species or something because we're so busy focusing in front of us. So pay attention to what's around you, not just to what's the center of attention right now, but whatever else is going on, because you can often get really good moments in those quiet spaces. So the last thing I want to talk about around composition is something that came to me from a journalist at the Toronto Star, um, and I went to a, a day of photo workshops, and the sentence that he said was the most valuable thing all day. And he said, if you want to make your pictures more interesting, shoot up, down, in, out, and through. Because the reality is, and I've been watching you guys as you've been moving around the room, that most pictures that can take you with a DSLR are taken like this, right? Most pictures that are taken with a phone are taken like this. Okay, so most of us when we use our phones, first of all, we're using portrait mode, not landscape. But when we use these cameras, we're shooting in landscape, not portrait. And the second thing is that most of those photographs are taken from the eye height of a standing adult human being. So 95% of photos that you see are taken that way. So if you want your pictures to stand out, change that. Shoot up. Shoot down. Shoot into a space from outside. Shoot out of the space that you're in. Shoot through something else. So use an arch or use something to make an arch. So if you have a tree branch, for example, you can use that to frame a subject. Okay, but if you shoot up, down, in, out, through, it's going to help your pictures to look more dynamic. So the picture that I have here, I shot over someone's shoulder down at the craft that they were making when they were in the Teru Teru a Hozu workshop a couple years ago. And by getting, you can see the direction that she's looking, you can see where her hands are, you're focusing on the craft that she's doing by changing that angle, and rather than just shooting straight across at her, by shooting down at it, it makes it a little bit more dynamic. I'm going to give you an example um, from a shoot that I did years ago in Mozambique with a community health worker. We provided the motorcycles for these folks. So the motorcycles, what's important to me in terms of showing our 
donors where their money went. But if you look at these two pictures, you can see the one where I shot her straight on, and the one where I just simply took one step forward and got down on one knee in front of her, not to propose marriage, <laughs> but to take a better picture. Okay, my wife would be shocked if she knew I was you know, walking up to strange women and getting down on one knee in front of them. But it was actually to take a better picture. And if you look at these two pictures, you can see how much better that picture on the right is than the one on the left. Okay? The one on the left does follow the rule of thirds. You will notice that she is on the one-third line coming in from the left-hand side. She is looking further into the frame and following the basic rules. But there is also a truck behind her, a truck next to her. She is relatively small in the frame. She is quite dark compared to the light area around her, which means that our eyes tend to look more at things that are light than things that are dark. Um, so remember I talked to you earlier about dark skin and lots of light? Mozambique is awful for that because it's one of the sunniest places I've ever been, and people there are among the darkest skinned people I've ever shot. Uh, so it's really difficult to handle that level of contrast, and you have to use tricks to make it work. You can use flash, you can use open shades. I had her standing under a tree, but even still, when you have that light behind her, you can see that the ground is gone. You can't see that. It's just pure white, even though if you look underneath the tree, you can see there's brown because the contrast was too high. So I minimized that in the second picture by crouching down, okay? So now I've got her face with a, a bit of a darker background. You can see her a little bit better. There's a leading line going up her right leg that leads you to look up at her face. There's a leading line going up from the, the, uh, the motorcycle through the front wheel that leads up to her. So you have this triangle bringing your eyes up to her face. By getting down to a lower level, I actually give her more power because when you look up at somebody, we use the phrase, I look up at somebody, to mean somebody that we respect. And that comes from the fact that children have to literally look up at adults. So people that they are supposed to respect and listen to and have authority, they look up to see them. So when we take somebody from a slightly lower angle, because if you get too low, you get up the nostrils, and that is not a good look on anybody. But if you get down a little bit, you can give them that bit of authority by just shooting from a slightly lower angle. Alternately, if you shoot from above somebody, again, it gives a different view to them, and the power dynamics can be there. So you can experiment a little bit with that as you're shooting things, um, but you can see the difference in those two frames just literally by taking one step forward and moving my angle, right? That there's a far better picture than if you were going to try and uh, tell people that they wanted to support this program, you're going to get a lot better donation response to the picture on the right than you will to the picture on the left. And literally, it's the difference of one step and going to one point, just to get that difference in those shots. So, the last thing that I want to do is to take a couple minutes before we wrap up and talk about the kinds of things that we can shoot at conventions. Because um, cosplay is one of the things that we always think about taking pictures of when we come to Otakon. You will see thousands of cosplay pictures when you leave this convention. You will see far less pictures that are about the life of the convention. And for me, what I'm most interested in uh, is the life of the convention. Part of that has to do with the fact that I'm on staff in a department and I actually like to take pictures of the work that we do in the department. Part of it, quite frankly, has to do with the fact that I'm a man in his mid-40s. Uh, taking pictures of cosplayers who tend to be women who are young enough to be my daughter, um, wearing usually not a lot of clothing, is not something I'm as comfortable with now as I used to be 25 years ago. Um, so I'm always a little bit conscious of that. Part of it is that, honestly, I've been doing cosplay photography for 20 years, so I want to find other things to shoot. Um, so I look at what are the things that I care about, and this is the way, when I run this workshop everywhere, I say, what is it you care about? What is the story you want to tell about what it is that you're doing? Okay, so some of the things that I care about when I come to a convention like Otakon or like Anime North are the guests. Right? They're who I'm here to see, who I'm here to learn from. What's going on in the hallways? Who am I here with? Who are my friends? Uh, what's happening in the events that I'm at? Um, and not to plug the workshops department, because I certainly don't work for workshops, but there's very interesting things that you can take pictures of, whereas in panels, unfortunately, what you have is talking heads. Um, and I'm not a big fan of having to take pictures of people talking to microphones, because that gets really dull. Um, event photography, where you're taking pictures of people shaking hands and, and people talking to microphones, is one of the worst kinds of photography you can ever be assigned to do if you're a professional photographer. Um, concerts are really great things. But this shot that I got last year at the Wotage workshop, I absolutely love. Right, that's, this is me using a slow shutter speed, okay, so I was shooting for one second uh, to get that shot. And it's people with the glow sticks dancing around, right? But I made sure that I had the camera on the table so that you can see the Enesong in the front. That's actually a pretty sharp focus, but I let the light go of people dancing to give a really different effect in that picture. 
right? Because to me, that was what that workshop was all about. This was people just having a great time with the, the glow sticks, and it didn't matter who they were because the room was basically pitch black. But what matters is what they're doing with those glow sticks. That's why I got that shot, and it's one of my favorite pictures from Otakon last year. Uh, in terms of guests, you can get really up close with some you know, relatively famous people. I mean, that's Summer Glad that I got a shot of a few years ago uh, at one of the conventions in Toronto. The guy on the left there is uh, Scott McNeil, who has, I don't know, somewhere like 10,000 voice acting uh, credits um, through the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, that was the last time I looked his picture on, uh, on Wikipedia, and I happened to grab it when I was chatting with him at uh, Fan Expo several years ago. Um, so you can get some really nice pictures of famous people when you come to conventions, which is something that personally I think is kind of cool. Because you know, I don't actually know any Hollywood people, so if I can get pictures of yeah, I said there I was someone by the other day, you know, getting some pictures of her is kind of nice. Um, also, use the environment. One of the things that I love is seeing cosplayers outside the convention. Because um, when you get the, the uh, quote unquote normal people as they watch somebody coming in cosplay and you know buying a, a pack of gum at the corner store. Uh, is really quite fun, uh, where, where we have the uh, cosplayer you know, in the weeds uh, to enhance the look of his cosplay. Um, also, just going back to that whole filling the frame thing, you can see uh, two pictures of Christopher Freeman here. Um, one of them taken from within the audience while he was presenting, and then the one where I got him when he was doing a signing afterwards. You can see the, the very different feel that you get just from the way you shoot different pictures. Um, I love to get detailed pictures as well. So I like to look at what's actually happening that people are doing just in their day-to-day -day living in a con. Two people fixing their costume. Right? Somebody working on a little thing that they made at the workshop. And the fact that they had written Oticon on the bottom of it made a great picture to advertise Oticon in my mind. Um, that's another picture of the container, so you can get a, a bit of a better picture, a better, better view than this one, where I have more of it in focus and you can see more of it. Um, and then the other one I got right down on the ground and close up with, uh, again, part of somebody's cosplay. Um, cosplay photo shoots can be fun, and I just like to get the energy around them. Um, and then also shooting the activity more than the person. So the picture on the right, the go board is what's in focus rather than the person playing. And so again, by choosing the focus that I've given you, what I'm saying is that the game is what's important more so than the person. Because the human brain is always going to look for faces first. We like to see human faces, we like things that look like us. But if the human face is out of focus and the game board is in focus, the viewer says, oh, this is actually about those game pieces. So by shooting that way, I say that the game of Go is more important than the guy who's playing it. And the last thing that I want you to do is when you are taking photographs, be a respectful photographer. Because there are an awful lot of jerks out there who make photographers have a bad name. Um, and we do that in the way that we approach the people that we take pictures of, and we do it in the way that we disregard the people around us. So always, always, always respect the person that you're taking a picture of and respect the people around you. Okay, ask permission before you take somebody's picture. Even if it's just lifting the camera and waiting for them to nod. Because often I don't speak the same language as the people that I'm shooting. So that's the only way that I can communicate with them. But by getting their permission, it makes it something that is consensual rather than me just grabbing their, their image. Um, in some places where I shoot, that's actually dangerous. That can get me uh, arrested or killed. Um, you guys hopefully are not in that situation at Oticon. <laughs> but it is still good to be respectful, particularly if you want to get a picture of a kid. If you see a kid in a really cute cosplay, ask the parents and ask the kid. Uh, I was shooting earlier today, and I said to the mom, hey, is it okay if I get your son in the frame? And she said, sure. And he said, uh, 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 uh. And so I turned around and took two steps to my left, so he was out of the picture and took a picture of mom. Because he didn't want to be in the picture. I'm being a respectful photographer. Be aware that there are other people trying to move around the convention, so don't block the space that's there. If it's a narrow corridor, and you want to get a picture of someone's costume, say, hey, can I get a picture of you? Do you mind if we just step over here with this bit more space? You also make it a better background that way. But what it means is you're not blocking that narrow corridor for the 300 people who are trying to get by to the next panel. Okay, so be respectful of the people that are there. If you're taking pictures in Artist's Alley or at the art show, um, don't take pictures of people's original art without their permission. That's just really not cool. Right? So always get permission before you take pictures of somebody's art. Um, you'll notice the permission to put up there is a very you know, specific thing. Because I think it's really important that we do that as photographers. Make sure that people are okay with us taking pictures of stuff that is theirs. 
So the last thing I want to say is where do you go next? If you want to get better at photography, the first thing you want to do is practice photography. The only way you will get better at photography is by practicing photography. I don't know if any of you guys watch Big Bang Theory, but there was an episode where like Sheldon was trying to learn how to swim, and he was trying to do it by watching things on the internet. It doesn't work. The way you become a better photographer is by taking pictures. But you do it in a way that you're reflecting on them, thinking about them, and learning from them. So I learned photography by reading books, because back in 1999, when I started doing photography seriously, there was no internet in the same way that there is today. There was no Instagram, there was no Flickr. You couldn't go to all these places to look at pictures. I actually used books and magazines to teach me how to do this stuff. Um, these days, you have the option of going to Instagram and scrolling through pictures. But find photographers who are doing interesting things that you like, follow them. And I look at the pictures and think about it. How did they do that? How are they using or breaking these rules? What's the stuff that they're doing? Um, there are websites that come from some of those magazines I used to read, some popular photography and Shutterbug or two that used to be really big magazines back in the day. Uh, YouTube is the place to go when you want to know how to do anything. If you need to know how to clean a clog, a clog drain, you go to YouTube. If you want to know how to use InDesign to add a, a block onto a page, you go to YouTube. And if you want to know how to take better pictures, you go to YouTube. Uh, Mike Brown is an amazing British photographer, and particularly his early videos on his channel do a phenomenal job of taking the basic concepts of photography, putting them into about 10 minute videos, and doing it in ways that are really easy to learn from. So I highly recommend looking him up on YouTube. Uh, the last thing is if you want to talk more about this, if there are things that would be helpful for you, or if you want to copy this presentation, drop me an email. I'm happy to share. Um, feel free to follow me on Instagram if you want, although I don't post there a lot, or on Flickr. Um, I do post photos there sometimes, not usually my field work uh, for my agency, but the other stuff I do in my life, um, you're certainly welcome to look at those pictures. Um, if there are any questions, we have about two minutes left. I apologize, we can rush. Um, we didn't have to start right on time, but I do want to finish this on time for the next workshop. So are there any last minute questions before I let you all go to your evening? Yes, sir. How do you reconcile the steps that are provisioned with kids? I was wondering that too. So um, there's a number of things that go into that. First of all is if, if I'm taking a picture which the person is not going to be identifiable, then I don't worry as much about permission. Uh, the Euro European Union passed a law last year called the General Data Protection Regulation. So that law says that if there is say, a group of people in a picture and the only one who would recognize them in that picture is their friend, friends or family, then you don't need to get their permission to take the picture. But if they are one of a picture of them or of only two or three people, you need to get their permission to, to do that. So that's one of the things that I look at is, am I going to be able to get people's, um, is it something that I need to worry about because they're one person in a crowd or because I'm taking a picture of an individual person? If somebody is doing something absolutely beautiful, then I may very well grab that shot to try and get that decisive moment and then show it to them. And say, hey, I just got this picture of you. I absolutely loved when you were doing this. Um, or if I can, I'll try and get it in advance. Uh, all of you who've done cosplay photography have already done this. I love your costume. Do you mind if I get a picture? So if you're worried about getting candidates in that kind of a case, um, what you want to do is spend time with the subject. Because when the camera comes out, people get really nervous, right? If I pull this out and stick this in your face, yeah. unless you're a professional model, you're going to get nervous, you're going to freeze up a little bit. But once I've been sitting there chatting with you and taking some pictures for 10 or 15 minutes, you're going to get more natural again, and I may get that candid thing that I'm looking for. When I'm shooting an event like Otakon, um, I'm being upfront about the fact that I'm here with a camera. So I'm walking into the workshops, and I'm going to grab some pictures. And actually, when you all signed your membership badges, you gave permission for Otakon to take pictures and use your pictures. Yeah. So I don't actually technically have to come to you guys for a picture. I try to get it where I can. Um, and I'll usually just say, hey, do you mind if I'm grabbing some shots? Um, and then, I'll, and then I'll say, keep doing what you're doing. I love what you're doing. I just want to get pictures of you doing whatever that is. Um, and it may not be exactly as candid, but it's going to be close to it. Um, but if it comes to like street photography, which is where you're just trying to walk down the street and get pictures of people, that becomes a really dicey in today's world, and it's not a genre that I work with. Um, but if you're interested in it, go online and look at street photographers and their uh, discussions about privacy. Uh, yes, it's worth knowing that in the United States, in general, if you take in general, there is no expectation of privacy in public. The only expectation of privacy is within a private person's home and in the restroom. Yeah, but um, if you're taking it and you're going to sell the picture, you do need to have a model release in the US. Yeah. So it's a question of how you're going to use the photo as well. Yep. Okay, so earlier you had like in, out, buzz, under, through. Like how much example? 
through. Um, so let's say you are looking um, out through the windows of a space or out through a doorway. You've probably seen pictures where like, you have the frame of a doorway and then beyond it is a seat. That's an example of a through picture. So what you could do is if you have, um, I'm trying to think through the Oticon space here, um, but what I might do is shoot from the ground level up at the, um, the second level. If I saw somebody who looked really interesting through the glass panels on um, the barrier there that stops them from falling off the ledge, and I might get a shot through that to get an interesting picture of somebody. Um, so that would be one example of how to do that here at Oticon. Uh, one last question, and then I'm going to let y'all go. I will still be around. Um, I'm here all weekend. Um, usually I'm around the workshop department, so if you want to talk about photography, um, I'm usually the guy with the camera. Any so. mm -hmm. other questions, or shall I let y'all go? All right, well, thank you so much. Thank Enjoy you.